I'd worked with Rupert Neve, and it was always, always his vision that you should push the technology of audio, analog electronics as far as you possibly could. So when it came to deciding on a console for this room, there kind of wasn't any other choice apart from the 88R. With the Neve 88R, they really kind of found that sweet spot. We have these discussions internally that somebody has an idea and then somebody says, yes, but we could do this as well. That's how Genesis evolved. We didn't start off by going, this is a blueprint. The console sounds fantastic. 1073 mic pre's that we've got in there, the cues that we've got on board, they're all about the best you can get. We've had a DFC at Abbey Road Studios. The amount of R&D involved in our Atmos implementation is uh, second to none. Today we've been working with the Sweetwater sales engineers here in the Genesis Black Studio, and it's that curiosity that really sets them apart. I feel like we have, we have a great friendly relationship with a lot of the Sweetwater engineers. It's knowing the products and how to integrate them correctly so the workflow for our clients will be the best possible for them to get the best results. As a kid, I was always interested in, in music and electronics, really. Uh, I learned the piano, violin, instruments like that. I was also loving listening to the records at the time, um, things like the shadows with their, their echoes and creating these new spaces, and started to make uh, recordings of, of me playing instruments and, and picked up the guitar. But then my recordings didn't sound very good, and so I started to try and uh, sweeten the effects and so I did things like making a re spring line reverb out of two telephone earpieces and a bit of coil wire in the middle and building an amplifier and a receiver for that. I then went off to university to do engineering and afterwards I worked at uh, Lucas Aerospace here in Burnley. There was a ma an American magazine called Electronics which I picked up and on the front cover was a little advert for a 16 pin device and it said so this is an echo chamber and I was hooked because my copycat tape loop, uh, the loops kept breaking and so and I was using sellotape to fasten the loops together and I thought I can make a solid state one of these, that would be great. And because I've been doing tape phasing with tape machines I thought I can make that process a lot easier and so I used them to make a, a true tape phase prototype where one bucket brigade sweeps through the other been to a few studios in Manchester, we then decided to see if we could take it down to Abbey Road. And so, why not? So we took a day off work, went down to Abbey Road and hoped to be able to show it to Paul McCartney, obviously an absolute hero of ours. Managed to get into the studio with him, Studio 2, for about two or three hours. And he played with this, this toy of ours and he, he bought one, which was just so so encouraging for us and that gave the confidence to to eventually leave our employment and and start full-time. Strawberry Studios in Dorking were saying well we love your flanger but what we really want is a digital delay and we said okay well you know I've got lots of experience in in the digital field as well as the analog field so you know we'll make one for you if you like and so that's what became the DMX 1580 and so at that point they were really, really happy with that. We used it on lots of albums. And so this was the drive. If, if people that we really respect and love are using our equipment and really enjoying it and really doing something creative with it, that's the drive that, that we had then and we have now. Then, of course, the market says, well, I love you, delay, but what we really want is a pitch changer. I used the 8086 that we got from Lucas and used that to do pitch changing. Then after that people said well we'll love you, your pitch changer but what we really want is, is um, a digital reverb so we produced the RMX 16 notoriously used by most of the British 80s artists and still in use today in the studio all these years on and then people said ah, we really want a digital console to go with that so we produced uh, the world's first fully automated digital console which was the Logic One. Way back in 1992 uh, Siemens owned both AMS and Neve. Siemens saw the benefit in having the two companies together and uh, but they spent two years trying to work out what to do about it. Eventually they made the decision to base it uh, here in Burnley. I was uh, asked to put the two companies together. There was a lot of work to do that and, and it did take a, a good number of years to sort it all out. At the time there were 150 
AMS people and 350 Neve people. So the first thing we had to do was to sort all that out. And so I then had to go and find out who are the movers and shakers? Where is the creative drive uh, in the organisation? It took quite a, a while to unearth that because obviously when there's been a merger, uh, you have all sorts of people, you know, uh, saying, well, I'm the most important person. You know, I'm Spartacus. Robin and John Turner in particular, those are the two I identified. They were, they were quite a long way down in the hierarchy and I just felt that was completely wrong. So. I wanted to give them the power to, to be able to exercise their, their talent in you know, a, a much better way. So it was taking the lid off the pressure cooker, really. We decided that, that really the V-Series uh, had done very, very well. And there were 400 and other things out in the marketplace. We set about a clean sheet of paper. What should the next, the next flagship Neve product be? And so that became the 88R. So the 88R was designed with um 5.1 as the get-go. It has to be for the 5.1 uh, system as well because that was important because that was where the record companies were going and also be able to do uh, film work as well. So one of the most, most important things about it was we needed to improve the sound quality over the VR. The VR was a very, very, very tough act to follow because it was a very, very good sounding console. But the ATAR needed to be better. We used some technologies which gave it um, a higher bandwidth, lower noise, better distortion. I'd worked with Rupert Neve on the Air Montserrat uh, consoles, and it was always, always his vision that you should push the technology of audio, analog electronics as far as you possibly could to get you not only the best sound, but the best technical qualities that you could get out of that sound as well. So that the frequency response was as high and as low as you could get it. The distortion was as low as you could get it. But with making sure that you were trying to make something that imparted no sound whatsoever to the recording. We took it to a show in San Francisco in 2001. And prior to that, um, people hadn't really been very enthusiastic about, about buying Neve kit. That new Neve, the new Neve was all we had to say about this thing. And people absolutely mobbed the booth, uh, got hold of the red knob, moved the faders around, looked at it and went, how much is it? They didn't say, what does it do? They didn't say anything else. It is pushed to the pinnacle of what you can produce. You know, and that's what that's how the ATAR came about. And I was responsible for the engineering, if you like, for that. Uh, when the studio was built, Mark and the technical team here, they approached this with decades of hindsight of studio design. So when it came to equipment, it came to the space, versatility was a huge part of that design. The studio flourishes whenever we need to upgrade or, or, or try something new. Uh, it's very easy to implement. Uh, and central to that is the Neve console. Uh, as I say, the, the design team here had worked in studios all over the world, so when it came to deciding on a console for this room, there kind of wasn't any other choice apart from the ATAR because it is so versatile and it is such a good analog console. Whether it's we're working in Pro Tools uh, on a pop session with like super high levels with loud guitars with loud synthesizers, or we're working on orchestral stuff that's in completely, you know, incredibly dynamic and has very soft, quiet parts and very loud parts. Sometimes when you have a piece of equipment that is very detailed, very comprehensive, very capable of doing lots of things, it can be also quite complicated to use. However, I feel like with the Neve 88R, they really kind of found that sweet spot. You can kind of do anything you ask of it, and it allows you to do it in a fairly simple way, something that you can digest, um, is laid out quite simply. Because the last thing you want on a, on a big recording session with lots of players, lots going on, is to kind of look at your console and kind of feel like, oh, I, I can't really 
see what's going on, or I don't know where to reach. Tried a lot of things with it. We've been asked to do things that we're like, oh, can, can, can we make that work? Can we set it up that way? And we've literally done orchestras to small bands to analog sessions purely on tape to massive Pro Tools sessions with multiple Pro Tools rigs. Uh, to live broadcast, we did a live broadcast to Japan using the console. We still find out things like to this day, like, oh, wow, I didn't know I could do that with the knee. Like, that's a really cool new angle and a new way of looking at things. Yeah. And it, you know, the other thing is it just sound, it sounds good. Like, it, the mic pre's on it sound amazing. It can also be very surgical as well if you need it. Yeah. The compressors on each channel are really good. Being a studio that's blessed with a lot of outboard, a lot of vintage gear, uh, a lot of modern gear as well, but there's often times where you can be recording and it's hard to justify using some of it because the, you can very easily mix or record a whole record on the leave without needing anything else. And the 88R proved to be um, a, a great console. But then we got a bigger toolbox, you know, my original set of, of bits has got bigger and so we've got all this other technology. What can we put together to make something that's even better and so that's how we conceived Genesis. There had been a market opening up for smaller recording studios that they still wanted to do 5.1. They still wanted a, a console that had all the attributes to the ATAR, but they didn't have a very big control room and they didn't have a big studio. And so we saw you know, a tier layer where you could still produce a console that people could afford that would have the Neve sound and the Neve technical, but still be able to, you know, record bands up and, you know, sort of six or seven or eight musicians quite comfortably. We have these discussions internally that somebody has an idea and then somebody says, yes, but we could do this as well. And then you let the customers into it and then they go, oh, yes, but we could do this. And so that's how Genesis evolved. We didn't start off by going, this is a blueprint. We started off by making something and then and then iterating it before we released this into something which was really going to be a, an amazing productive tool. From this studio, our demo studio here in Burnley in the UK, we offer in-depth training packages for vendors and clients from all over the world. So what we'd like to do is to invite clients to come here to check out our facility, tour the manufacturing side of the business and also spend a day, two days here in the studio with me going through all of the ins and outs of a Neve console so that clients really get, the, get to grips with how these things work. Today we've been working with the Sweetwater sales engineers here in the Genesis Black Studio. We've spent the full day going through all of the ins and outs of this console from uh, tracking through to overdubbing and mixing and really using every feature on the console. Uh, I think one of the key things that we've got across today is that this console has ultimate flexibility and so many wow factors that the engineers were amazed by. I'm really confident that they've built up a great knowledge on the Genesis Black to be able to pass on to their, uh, their many clients around the world. So one of the things about getting the sales engineers over here is that it really helps us to connect with not just the sales engineers, but the customers that they know and work with over the years. I think for Sweetwater, a lot of our clients call us and a lot of them are building their dream studios or they're building their rooms. It's really important that we have a grasp on the technology to help integrate uh, the consoles. I've been integrating a number of the Genesis Black consoles and doing some installations for clients and they do rely on us on making sure the patch bays are configured correctly, the wiring, uh, the routing. As we get into multiple workflows, whether somebody's mixing stereo, they might be mixing Atmos or they may be doing Atmos and stereo, it's knowing the products and how to integrate them correctly so the workflow for our clients will be the best possible for them to get the best results. Sweetwater are obviously amazing as far as customer support goes and that relationship that they have with their customers. So by connecting with the sales engineers, we have almost a direct link to those customers. Uh, any knowledge that they learn from these sessions will no doubt go directly down the line to the customer and will help them to make an ideal decision for when they're picking the right, uh, right console for their studio. So here we run two different types of manufacturing uh, processes. One is the traditional hand-wired, hand-soldered, hand-assembled 
uh, manufacturing process and then we have the modern day surface mount process which is a little more involved and requires a, an exceptional amount of planning to become efficient and we run both side by side so we'll take a, a quick look at the surface mount to start with so right at the very beginning of the kind of circuit board uh, and unit life starts with the components the individual components so what we have we have these uh, storage and they're kind of like um, electronic stock keepers where they store the components needed to go on reels, which we'll get to in a moment. And these machines talk to the uh, assembly machines in terms of stock. So the assembly machines will pick some stock from a reel and place it on a circuit board. And then what happens is that machine will tell it these that it's used it. So these will refill the stock for the next time reels are done. So in a morning or on a Monday morning when we've got a plan of we need to run a certain type of circuit board, let's say 200, 300 of them. Then we'll punch it into this machine and say we need 200 of these boards. These will automatically serve the reels that go into these machines and then these machines will assemble the circuit boards automatically for us. So it's a very clever and very efficient way of managing stock and components and keeping everything safe and uh, just generally less waste. So what happens is the, the pick and place machines uh, basically have robotic heads that are programmed to move to the sides of these machines and pick up the components from the reels that would be inserted here. And the components are picked up by the robotic heads and placed exactly on the circuit board uh, where they need to go. And it's, it's very, very precise. It's incredibly precise, in fact. And they, they whiz around and they can work on independent circuit boards, one arm per circuit board, or both can work on one circuit board if we need something really quickly. They can both work without banging into each other <laughs> and uh, put the components exactly where they need to. Once that process is complete, the circuit board then moves along into the uh, temperature controlled oven. So this is um, an oven with multi-zones of heating and, and cooling. And as a circuit board goes through, the oven is programmed to know which circuit board type that is. So it heats and cools areas of the circuit board as it moves through to the perfect temperature so we don't overcook something and we don't undercook something it's absolutely perfect as it goes through and then once it gets out of the end of the oven it then goes into the inspection machines and what we do here we check every single joint so the human eye is very good at picking up some things but not when you're on a scale of a microprocessor with thousands of pins in a size that's that big so again, we have to rely on automation and clever uh, robotics almost. So these machines look at every single solder joint on a circuit board and they take images of it and they can see into the solder joint. So a solder joint may look okay to the human eye, but inside it might be cracked. There might be a speck of dust that's been involved in the process. Uh, in other words, not a good joint, even though it looks good. So these machines pick out all the bad joints by firing all kinds of sonar, infrared, you name it, it fires it into there and picks out the bad joints. It then flags up which joint is bad so the operators can take out the card and manually reflow just that joint so they don't have to look for anything, they know exactly where it is. So they just manually reflow it, make sure it's good, put it back into the machine, check it again and hopefully it passes. Now once we get to that stage, we've made a circuit board. Uh, a good example is uh, this one which is an NSPX or a DPX. So the components there have been placed by the machine so no human has touched this yet uh, and then once inspected and the machine passes it we know that that when it's placed into a, a chassis, a unit, a front panel is placed on we know that that circuit board is 100% QA'd that it's going to work for 50, 60, 100 years because we know that every single thing on that is perfect. So we're designing the, um, the quality at the very initial stage, before this even becomes something you can turn on. It's already meticulously QA'd. We then get onto what we call the, the second stage process, which is where uh, operators manually fit things that the machines cannot do. So things like intricate um, uh, pots and switches, uh, transformers for example, they, they are hand-wired and then onto a connector which plugs into the surface mount machines. So there's lots of things that the machines cannot do, which the, uh, the assemblers take over. So this is the second stage of assembly. The operators follow a system which we call Quick Tick and it basically tells them what to do. So we can uh, use this software to manage the assembly. So if, you, if we've got a new unit 
uh, introduced into production. It also comes with uh, a guide on how to make it. Very important because that means we can move people around and, and cross-skill people. So if we need uh, demand on consoles, we can move people across to build consoles. If we've got a surge on outboard gear, we can bring in people from consoles to outboard. So we can move people around really quickly because the, the software tells them how to build it, which is fantastic. It's such a time saver and it, it emits almost every single error that a human can make and it follows all the guidelines on how to assemble these things properly so that they are perfect. Once we then have the, uh, the circuit boards and the, the manually fitted things, we then get the, the chassis, the metalwork. So the metalwork is uh, manufactured by other companies. We, um, we purchase that kind of stuff from uh, local, regional or national suppliers. Uh, we don't manufacture that here, but everything is made to our specification. So we'll get them into uh, our stores area, ready for wheeling down uh, for the next batch of units, whatever they may be. And then one by one, the circuit boards and the front panels are placed together to make up the units. So there we've got a unit with the circuit board in, but no front panel just yet. Just above it, we've got the same units with the front panels on. So stage by stage, these are built up layer by layer until we get to the, uh, the completed units. The completed units are then plugged into an automated test machine and the automated test machine runs every single parameter that it can to make sure it's going to work uh, and make sure that when you press a switch that the correct thing actually happens. Again, it's automated so we don't have to do any of that. And then at the very last stage, uh, it goes into the listening room where we plug a set of speakers, a set of headphones and an audio source and listen to the unit to make sure that it sounds just as it should. What I haven't covered is the, the classic outboard, which is made in the traditional manner, which is the uh, hand-assembled, hand-soldered, hand-wired. A machine never touches this stuff. So if we take a look at some of these modules, onto the classic units, these are intricately put together. These are uh, mesmerizing to look at because they're hand-soldered, they're hand-wired, they're hand-assembled. If you can just pick out the detail on some of the, uh, some of the connections on the back of the switching, for example, and a machine never touches this. This is made by hand, 100%. And some people say, why, why do you still do this when you've got a machine down there that can do the same thing in a tenth of the time? Well, we do it because people still want them. People still need to know that they're, they've got the original Neve hand-wired item. So there's a huge demand for these, as well as the surface mount. These are, some people call this the real deal. It's, it's the original real deal but the surface mount um, versions that we make are the real deal, they're just made in a different way. As, um, as we, were we were talking last night, we really only been producing the really large big consoles and having this big battle with SSL obviously over them. Um, but this was our first, first attempt at uh, going into studios that uh, couldn't really afford an, an ACAR um, or didn't really want to go to have an ATAR because you know they just wanted to do things a bit more simpler and and, and differently and so we we came up with the uh, this Genesis as, well as you can see just by the way it looks at it this is a, a smaller and, and typical what I would call a jobbing studio like you know if you went to you went to a, studio, a little studio in, in uh, Fort Wayne or Toledo this is this is the sort of thing you would find, you know, and it would be, it would be for people, people that just had, you know, they had a band, a six-piece band, or it could be a, a ten-piece brass band or twenty-piece brass band, and they've got just about enough room to get them all in and record them and produce their their album at a reasonably good price point. So here we are in Studio One at Lipper, and this is a studio that we refurbished four years ago. Um, when we considered all of our different options for equipment and predominantly the mixing console here, we decided to go with a, a Neve Genesis console. And we decided that this would be a small console, like this would be the right console for the, for the studio. We also consulted our students and said, you know, what sort of thing would you like? 
in the studio. We hadn't had a Neve console in Leopard before, so we figured this was a good opportunity for us to, um, to have the, the Neve badge on, on something significant in one of our studios here. Once our students have got to grips with the, the basics of signal flow and the, the understanding of all the facilities that you'd have on a typical mixing console, which is something that they do on, on less complex consoles in the first year, in the second year they're ready for something which really takes them to the next level. So the reason why we like this console here is that in some ways it's very simple to use. If you want to record a drum kit in the other room and you just want to set up you know, 12 mics on a drum kit, bring them through the desk, do a bit of EQing, do a bit of dynamics, through a bit of parallel compression and do some work on a, on a, on a reverb as well, then it's so simple with this desk to then just capture all of that in Pro Tools as it sounds through the console and take it away and work on it further. Then we get to the end of the project where it's more about mixing. Well, we've got so many options now, you know, you can just mix in a box as so many people do. Or we can use this console and we encourage people to use this console for what you might call stem mixing, where we bring things out in groups. You might bring the drums out on, on two or three audio outputs and run them through two or four faders on the, on the console and spread the rest of the mix out and try and get away from looking at the screen and looking at the Pro Tools session as your sort of primary indicator of where the mix is going. Just use your ears. And of course, you've got the added advantage of being able to use EQ and dynamics, using the auxiliary sends to get to any of the reverb processes that we have in here, doing all of that on the console and then, of course, saving that within the console so you can just return to it at a later stage or alternatively with this uh, fantastic um, Neve Genesis plugin that allows us to control the console we can we can apply automation to all of these things within the Pro Tools session but it's controlling the analog signal path and what happens on the console itself. Additionally the console sounds fantastic. 1073 mic pre's that we've got in there, the EQs that we've got on board, they're all about the best you can get. So our students get to experience how good things can really sound if they're using the right mics and they're using the right kind of processing techniques then if they've got a console like this they can, they can only enhance the work that they've already put into their recordings. Before we bought the console we went to visit the factory and, and we, we, we met Joe and the team down there and uh, we were impressed by the, the, the systems that they have in place there, how they, they have an emphasis on employing people in the local community and uh, actively involved in making as much of the materials as they possibly can you know, within that vicinity of, of, of Lancashire where they're based. So we, we like that ethos that they have and, um, and we just feel like we've, we've got a really nice working relationship with them. They offer a prize to some of our students who, um, who do excellent work in post-production so they come along to graduation and see our students graduate every year. Um, so we're, we're very proud of our relationship with Neve and uh, we hope it continues. 1073. 1073 is a great piece of kit. You know what it's going to sound like. You know how to get the best out of it. You know how to get the best out of your Ferrari or McLaren around a racetrack. You know how it handles on corners. It does have quite a unique layout with having those two transistor gain stages on that front end and you can kind of drive it if you want to. You can push the preamp up almost all the way into harmonic saturation if you want to. One of the reasons why they are the best and why people like them the most is they're very, very forgiving. In other words, you can abuse these and you still get good sound out of them. And I think that's one of the reasons why they are liked so much, you know. 1073 or 1084 with the extra, having the high and the low pass filter has always been one of my favorite um, preamps. I think it's legendary for as far as the tracking anything, um, the mic pre and the inductor EQ. I think that sound of a record, it's a lot of us listen to Neve and that's, that's kind of the sound that we all uh, try to achieve when we're tracking records. But one of the things it gives you if you're using a 1073 is that you can apply it to almost any instrument type and you know you're going to get the highest quality sound out of that instrument. I think that's probably the thing that's uh, gave it, given it such longevity over the years. It's, it's something we take great pride in making exactly to, to specification. But we had to put EQ and dynamics on the console, so we did it by making these boards that you can plug in the back. So you can have eight EQs and you can have eight dynamics, and then you can control them from the screen, either on the screen or you can control it from the encoders 
on, on here. Obviously, there's loads of stuff happen underneath this to make this in actual fact what it is. So um, if you come and have a look here, these modules do all the switching and routing and signal sending to the door, to the EQs, to the dynamics if they're fitted. And they've got the mic amp with the uh, transformer in it. And these communicate to each other through a central uh, computer at the back. And they have a PIC processor and the PIC processor runs all of the analog electronics. So this is very, very sort of digitally controlled analog. It's still analog though. It's not DSP, okay? And that's another thing that people really like about these consoles, they're still in the analog, analog land. We developed the DFC for the film mixing market. We consulted film mixers uh, in the US, the UK, worldwide to see what their needs were in progressing from an analog mixing console to a digital mixing console. The sound quality was paramount. Control of multiple inputs, the ever-increasing amount of inputs from workstation was also very necessary. In tandem with them, we developed the DFC mixing console. At the beginning, we were looking at 5.1, and then it evolved to 7.1, and then Dolby Atmos was discussed 12 years ago. So our involvement with Dolby has been lengthy and the amount of R&D involved in our Atmos implementation is uh, second to none. And we also involved Skywalker Sound and they were instrumental in providing the operational aspect for uh, Dolby Atmos. So the Dolby Atmos workflow for film really came from 12 years ago. I think we started off with a DFC uh, primarily focused on film mixing, mixing to picture. But uh, as Dolby have evolved their Atmos strategy for music as well, then we see the DFC being of interest to mixing music uh, for Atmos uh, format as well. So it's not necessarily constrained to film mixing. And we have a long history with music recording, with the higher uh, end studios that have been pushing the barriers of uh, music recording and music mixing. We've had a DFC at Abbey Road Studios for quite a few years. So we evolve with partnerships and listening to what our users want to do, how they want us to evolve, and also our partnership with Dolby. met Matt and Joe from AMS Neve a few years ago uh, when, we, when we brought them on board. Always been a big fan of the, of the products and used their products personally in my own studio. And uh, the relationship from the beginning just hit off like we were all just really close friends. Um, all of us have a passion for the technology and, the, and just analog gear. They've been out to Fort Wayne uh, multiple trips a year. Um, we're out here now in the UK and, and it's, it's just been a really, really good partnership. And both of us with the same goal that probably, you know, like I, I think we both do what's the right thing for both of our clients. So the focus of both companies have been very aligned um, to help clients get the best possible experience out of their console purchases. One of the things I enjoy most about working with Sweetwater is the, the personalities of the sales engineers. I, I've met several. Uh, well, more than several since they, uh, since there are so many sales engineers employed at the Sweetwater HQ. Everyone who I've met, I've instantly formed a good relationship with. They're all really friendly. Uh, they all really know what they're on about as well. They, they want to learn, you know, they want to explore as much as they can about how to get the best possible sound out of the signal chain. And it's that curiosity that really sets them apart. I feel like we have, we have a great friendly relationship with a lot of the Sweetwater engineers and I hope to meet even more of them next time I head over there. Well, I think the thing I found with Sweetwater when I visited it was um, how encompassing it is. I realized that um, Neve lives in this incredibly small niche part of Sweetwater and that, uh, that there's a huge, uh, uh, great big uh, business which is much, much more than just outboard gear at uh, Sweetwater. I was working for a, a power supply company 
they made power supplies, but it was very rigid. You had to go to you had to go to work at eight o'clock, and you'd come home at, at five o'clock. You had clock cards that you clocked in and you clocked out. And when I came to work for Neve, there was none of that. You could come and go as you pleased, and you were trusted. And I get the same sense at Sweetwater. It's the same sort of way of working, which I think is really, really good. We've talked about how communication within in, in the company is absolutely paramount to the success that we, we are achieving. And once we tied up with Sweetwater, we found the same capability to be able to talk things over with you. Um, we've improved some of our processes to help you. Uh, I think you understand very closely what we're doing, what we're about. Our turnover has actually doubled over the past couple of years and we uh, are on a, a path to continuous growth but maintaining all the, the characteristics that, uh, that I've talked about, about the culture of the business going forward. We're really impressed and, and really happy to be working with you. Enthusiasts of all description, even in the sales departments, is, is, is wonderful. <laughs>